What's up? Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com here for episode number 88 of Goulet Q&A. This week it is July 24th. Had to look at my calendar there because I barely ever know what day of the week it is. But uh, for this week I've got a, you know, fairly decent number of questions, 10 questions. So um, I'm going to give you a quick little update on what I've been up to in my work life and then we'll get into the questions. So first off, the big thing that we've had going on this past week is we got the Twisby Eco in. This is the latest pen available from Twisby. The Eco stands for economical, so it's Twisby's least expensive pen they've ever come out with, $28.99. It's pretty awesome. It's available in white and black. They're pretty much, well, yeah, they're basically gone. I mean, I'm having to say this on Thursday morning. It's not gonna publish till Friday. Uh, they're, they're basically gone by the time you're seeing this. We're gonna get more in a couple of weeks. I don't know exactly when. But uh, it's pretty exciting. So these are, honestly, I'm very impressed with these pens. Same nibs as what's on the uh, Twisby Classic and Twisby Mini. So it's a little bit smaller nib than what's on the 580, but still writes really well. And uh, I've had a good writing experience with mine so far. I've got a fine and a broad nib that I kept personally. I didn't keep too many because I know everybody is wanting them. So try to keep as many available for the pen community as possible, uh, but uh, really kind of cool. So uh, I have a blog post on that. It posts and everything, doesn't post on the filler knob. So I have, a, I have a blog post that I did on Wednesday that you can go back and see. It's just a written blog post with some pictures and stuff, answering some of the, I know, hottest questions that are gonna be out about the Eco. I'm gonna be working on a video, but we're a little short-staffed right now because we got a lot of people on vacation, so I'm kind of covering for different stuff. So uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to get to it right away, but just in case, uh, go check out that blog post. You can ask any questions you have on the blog post there. Uh, to get updates on the Eco. Uh, also picked up Maruman Nemosign uh, notebooks. So I got a pretty comprehensive video about that that also went out on Wednesday. So you can check that out. 16 minutes of paper details for you there. Pretty cool line of notebooks, really good paper quality, very comparable to Rhodia actually. So um, I'm quite impressed. So that's really exciting to be carrying a really nice high quality notebook line like that. So you can check more out about that. Um, and then coming up this coming week, we got a couple of uh, couple of kind of interesting things. Uh, J.R. Bond has a fountain pen. They've had a rollerball pen for a number of years, um, but they basically have a fountain pen version of the same pen uh, with kind of a fine medium-ish nib. So I'm gonna have that up in the nib nook soon. I'm gonna have the Twisby Eco up in the nib nook as well. Uh, the nib nook is a writing sample tool that we have on our site. I do writing samples with every pen nib combination that we have in our store. So you can check that out and compare them to each other. Um, but uh, $14 for this little pen. So it's, you know, it's uh, it's definitely an affordable pen. Um, you know, it's ones that are gonna compete with it are gonna be like the Pilot Metropolitan and the stuff like that. So it's like, hmm, the Kuwaiko uh, probably would be comparable as well. It can't be converted to an eyedropper unless you do a hack on it because it's got these little holes in the back. So you have to fill those holes. And so that's kind of a bummer a little bit. So, and it's too short to fit any type of converter. So it's basically just a standard international ink cartridge. So I don't know if that's gonna be your thing, but um, I don't know if I'll get to even get to do a video on that, maybe a quick look or something eventually, but that'll be coming. And then um, next week I'm gonna have the Cross Century 2 uh, coming out as well. It's kind of like a little Townsend. So it's like a blend between the Townsend, which is like their flagship pen, and then the um, the century, Classic Century, which I already did a video on that. It's a very small, thin pen. So this one is kind of in between size-wise. It's styled very similarly to the Townsend. Um, has the same nib and grip and everything as what's on the Classic Century. So I'll have those coming out soon. I'm gonna try and get a video on this uh, together for you soon as well. So. That's kind of what I've been up to. And then uh, I've been doing more periscoping as well, picking up a lot of speed, over 700 followers now on Periscope, which is pretty cool. Um, so, you know, Rachel and I are having a great time broadcasting at night, uh, doing some Q&A stuff. I'm just kind of hitting stuff throughout the day. It's, it's a lot of fun, I really like it. If you haven't looked into Periscope yet, check it out on your iPhone or Android, and you can also view the desktop version as well. Um, so that's really kind of cool. Um, and I recently have uh, coaxed Brian Gray from Edison Pens to get in on there, and he's totally hooked as well. He and I both have kind of a history of doing live broadcasting um, for our audiences as well, so he's really kind of digging it. Um, he was back in like Ustream, you know, six, seven years ago, and he uh, he kind of gave me the idea to start doing live broadcasts. So it's kind of kind of kind of full circle situation there. So um, that's what's up in my world for this week. Now let's get into some of the questions. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with, uh, I really only have one pen or writing question uh, this week. I mean, everything's kind of related to pens, but um, from In Love With Journals on YouTube, 
Uh, he asked, I like to post my caps. Can you tell me which pens have caps that actually screw to the barrel when posted? Um, that's uh, a good question because there are not many of them at all. I actually had to rack my brain a little bit and I had to go over to my pen cabinet and like look at every single pen and be like, am I missing one? Because there are so few that do. I don't think it's very common at all because for most people, that's kind of annoying. I mean, I get that it's like super secure and on the back of the pen, but it's like an extra step to have to do. Especially with a fountain pen, it's like if you're writing a quick note and then you need to cap it again. If you do like to write with your thing, your, with your pen posted, it's so much easier just to have it slipping on the back there. So that's the way most companies do it. That said, I have two pens that I can think of that I know have an actual screw posting. One of them is a pen that I don't even carry. I don't even know if it's made anymore. I don't know the status of this. This is a Stipula Passaporto. So it's a very small pen. Um, it was over $100, so it was kind of expensive, which is why we never carried it originally. I heard they took it away and then they kind of brought it back. I don't know the status of this pen, just to be completely honest with you, but it's one that I had in my personal collection from several years ago that has a screw thread on the back. Now, the reason this one has that screw thread is because it's such a small pen. You basically, you know, and that, look at me trying to hold this thing. It's like literally doesn't even reach my, my, the nook of my hand here. So I have to, I have to post this thing to be able to even write with it. So having that screw thread really kind of helps in the stability of this pen. That's why this has it on there. Um, and then the other one, which I don't have it on me, I wish I'd grabbed it off the shelf, but I don't have one, is the, um, the Cross Classic Century. Very small, very thin, um, but I think because it's so thin, they put that screw posting on there so that it has extra stability. It's a metal pen, it's, it's really thin. So um, that's the only other one that I can think of. There might be others out there, I'm sure there are others out there, but it's just not that common of a thing in the fountain pen world to have a screw posting. So if there are any others, let me know in the comments. For ink, <clears throat> got several ink questions this week, so everybody just more, had more ink stuff on their mind this week. Uh, Travis W on Facebook kicked it off saying, what are your favorite ink uh, available, uh, favorite inks available in cartridges? preferably grouped by color and or pri proprietary design. Um, so I don't really have any group by color necessarily. I tend to personally gravitate just in general more towards blues. Shocking, I know. If you know anything about me, you know I'm obsessed with blue. So uh, proprietary design though, I think what I tend to, so one of the things that stinks about cartridges just in general is when you have a proprietary uh, design, so like Lamy, Pilot, you know, a lot of these brands that have kind of platinum when they have their own cartridge converter design. Basically, you're limited to those inks that are available in those cartridges. At least with standard international cartridges, you can get ones made by Diamine, Faber Castell, Mont Blanc, Monograppa, Omos, Cueco, Pelican, Jerbon, Private Reserve. There's lots of different brands that make standard international cartridges. Lots of different ink brands that have standard international cartridges. So if you get a pen that has a standard international cartridge, you have a lot more color options as far as your cartridges go than you would going with something like Pilot or Lamy or something like that. Now granted, you can always refill your cartridges with a syringe or something like that, ink syringe, but that's an extra step. So if you're purely talking about the convenience of using cartridges, I would go with a pen that is standard international. Just personally, that's what I tend to use. So when I am using pens that I know that I'm gonna use with cartridges, it'll pretty much always be standard international, just so I have some ink options. Um, so some of my favorite ink options, generally speaking, I like Diamine and Private Reserve, just because they have the biggest range of colors. Um, and they have a couple of my favorite colors, actually probably more so Diamine even than Private Reserve. Private Reserve has a lot of good mid-range blues, which I really like. Uh, my favorite I have is, um, uh, Private Reserve wise, is Electric DC Blue. It's a nice deep blue with kind of a red sheen to it, so I like that. Um, Diamine Majestic Blue, very similar to Private Reserve's Electric DC Blue. I like that. Diamine Ancient Copper is a really cool ink. Uh, Diamine Oxblood too. It's a nice deep red as well. So those are some of my, just off the top of my head, some of my, my more favorite colors. More favorite? That sounds weird. Is that right? favorite -er? No, that doesn't make any sense. More favorite. But anyway, so there you go. Hopefully that points you somewhat in the right direction. Um, at Clasbill on Twitter, 
For swabs or written ink tests, how often do you redo them to check for fading? Um, that's an interesting question. So fading basically uh, j happens due primarily to UV exposure. Um, so some of it can happen with office lights, but it's more, uh, you know, sunlight. I'm pointing this way because that's where the windows are in the front of our building. Uh, that means absolutely nothing to you if you're watching this on the video. But in window land, um, when you have a journal or whatever piece of paper that's sitting out for, it honestly could be a matter of just several days with some inks. Um, I find that uh, blues, like kind of mid-range royal blues, tend to be more susceptible and reds are really pretty susceptible to fading with UV exposure. So if you are writing in a notebook and you're leaving it sitting out in bright sunlight for days, weeks, whatever, you could notice some fading even in that period of time. Uh, that said, it's a lot of time and effort to do ink swabs, ink reviews, writing samples, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to have to redo the same ones over and over again. So I take a lot of precautions to keep them out of the UV light. They are always in a temperature controlled environment. I use all pH neutral, acid free paper. So when I'm doing ink reviews and swabs and stuff like that, I am taking every precaution that I can to keep fading from being something that I have to worry a lot about. That said, when I have gone back and checked, and, and I, I don't do this like, I mean, I have 600 different inks, so I don't do this with all the inks on a regular basis, but when I have gone back and checked, I've found them to be very spot on. So fading is not something that is of utmost concern for me because I take those precautions to keep it from happening. So likewise, if you are, you know, keeping your own little ink swabs or whatever, like, one of the things I you know, pointed out with the Maraman uh, word cards is that they work really great for doing ink swatches, right? So keeping these out of sunlight, if you leave it sitting open like this on your super bright southern facing window for weeks at a time, you might notice some fading. But if you keep them out of direct sunlight, stored away, not in a crazy weird type of environment, you'll be okay. Cool. Um, got a question from Brian H. on Facebook. I love using Nidler's Bad Blue Heron in my Pilot Metropolitan, but the nib creep is so bad that it gets on the grip when capped, even when stored tip up. From what I understand, this could be caused by the saturation of the dye that's in the ink. Is dilution an option to help stop the nib creep, or does this sound like it's a pen issue? Um, okay, so for those of you that don't know, nib creep essentially is when you have uh, fountain pen ink in your pen and the ink actually kind of comes up out of the slit of the nib and comes up onto the surface of it. Having, okay, so you threw up a bit of a, mm, like a eyebrow raise for me when you talked about it, nib creeping so bad with the nib pointed up that it's actually pouring out of the nib and getting on your grip. That's pretty rare and pretty hard to have happen. There's got to be something going on that's causing that because just, just by the capillary action alone, I find it a little tough to believe that that's the case. Especially like the Metropolitan is a little bit prone to nib creep, I'll give you that. And Bad Blue Heron, like that ink is one that is particularly like flowing. Um, and yeah, it's got saturation of the dyes and stuff like that. That's actually not so much what it is. There's a, there's a lot of dye in a lot of Noodler's inks, but it's not actually the dye that makes it saturate, that makes it nib creep like that. It's, it's kind of a correlation is causation thing. It's not the dye, dye is actually very dry. Um, it's lubricants that are added to the dye to help it flow better. So when you have a lot of dye, it really dries it out. So they add lubricant so that it flows smoother. So what's happening when you're diluting it, like you asked me about here, is you're actually diluting the lubricant. Yes, you're also diluting the dye, but you're diluting the lubricant too. So the water is not as wet and flowy as the lubricants that are in the pen. So dilution can help with some inks, but it just depends on the dye content and how much lubricant is added and stuff like that. So it's not like, yes, if you dilute it, it will absolutely make it better, especially in this context. I don't know, this is kind of a unique situation um, from what I'm seeing, but what more I wanna focus on 
is not so much will the dilution help with the nib creep. It's more, I think your, your nib creep may not actually be the cause of the ink getting on your pen, um, on your grip. So there's a couple of things that I think could be going on. Um, I think that if you're care, I'm just gonna have to speak kind of generally because I don't know exactly your situation. If you're carrying your pen around and you have ink in it and it's sloshing back and forth and back and forth, especially if you're going in, you know, it's summertime right now in the Northern hemisphere anyway. And if you're going from the outside, especially if you're in your car, it's really hot. If you have your pen in your pocket, it's on your body, it's really hot. You come inside where it's nice and temperature controlled and air conditioned and stuff like that. Your inside of your pen is gonna be hot. Inside the wherever building you're in is gonna be cooler. So whenever there's heat and cool, that's higher pressure inside your pen and come into a cooler environment, it's gonna wanna push ink out of the pen. So. If you're carrying the pen around and going from hot to cold environments, that can cause ink to want to come out of the pen. Now granted, it might not be a lot, and depending on how you're carrying it, it might be to different degrees. Obviously, if it's nib pointed down, it's gonna be a little worse, but if you are carrying it like that and ink can come out of that and kind of get in your cap, then when you go to store it nib up, it can fall onto the grip. So I think that might be a possible scenario for what's happening. I don't think it's the pen is perfectly fine. And then when you set it nib up in your pen jar or however you're storing it, that all of a sudden it's just gonna blah, come out of the top because it's not a volcano. It doesn't spew out of here. Unless perhaps you're dealing with a heat temperature kind of situation. Maybe it's not so much a ink is being jostled around out of your pen, but it could be if you're in your car, you have a commute to work, it's really hot, whatever, it sits on your dashboard, whatever it might be. And then you bring it inside. If you have a lot of heat inside the pen, then what happens is you have ink that's inside your feed and then you have a little air bubble in here. If your ink level is a little kind of low, you have a big air bubble in here with hot air. And then you come and put it in your office where it's nice and 72 degrees or whatever. Um, and then that heat in there can cause whatever ink that is in the feed to then want to come out, which I don't think it would usually come out of the slit like nib creep would. I imagine it's coming out of more where it's filling from or it's like seeping out of the feed and then it's getting on your grip. So. Maybe that kind of helps to explain a little bit. I don't think it's a nib creep issue, and I don't necessarily know that diluting it would really help with this so much. I think it might be more of a temperature or coming in and out or traveling around kind of situation. So what I would recommend is doing a thorough cleaning of the cap and everything, maybe even just try flushing out the pen altogether. And you can try inking it up with the same ink and see if it still does it. It could be that you know, you've had ink that's been building up in your cap for a while, and then every now and then when you set it, it just kind of gets onto the grip. Um, or it might just be that the ink pen combination is maybe just prone to that. So you could try that ink in a different pen or a different ink in that pen or whatever it might be. Try it with the cartridge that maybe came with the Metropolitan, see if it still does it. Just try and switching it around, doing a little experimentation. It is sometimes that certain inks in certain pens, just whatever the, whatever the physics of it, how it works out, they just tend to creep or leak more than others. So that's kind of where I stand with that. It'll take a little bit of experimenting to see kind of what works. Um, if you want to try the dilution, I don't think it would hurt anything. Uh, I would just recommend doing it in a kind of a small batch. So maybe take an ink sample vial or something. I'm looking around to see if I have one to show, but uh, a little ink sample vial. Like such, you know, so you can just mix up a little bit of ink at a time. Uh, and dilute that. Don't go diluting your whole bottle because then if it doesn't work or you overdo it and it's too saturated, it's too desaturated, then you haven't wasted a whole bottle. So that was kind of the not so quick, quick answer to your question there, Brian. But I, hopefully that some of that can help you out. All right, uh, I'm going to take a sip of water before I get into the next question. So sorry. Mm. Ah, that is nice and cold. All right. Next question is from YouTube, Fer Ferrara Photographics on YouTube. Ferrara Photographics. What's the big deal about mold? How easy is it to have a pen infected? What is the long-term damage to my pen? Is it just a good cleaning and I'm back to normal? I have bottles of ink that are 15 plus years, years old. No sign of mold. Is this more common in very humid climates? Okay, so you are getting like a, what, five in one question here? Um, so I will say that mold definitely can happen. It doesn't happen often. 
I really don't hear about mold issues much, especially mold issues that are like rampant throughout your pens and that kind of stuff. Often, if it's anything, there might be like some, some funky stuff kind of growing in the ink, but it, it doesn't, I mean, it certainly can get into your pens, but it's, it's not probably as common as you might think. I think it's just when it does happen, people get so freaked out about it that it spreads far and wide and you think it's a really kind of scary, pervasive issue. Um, so I can't really speak to what they were doing with inks 15 years ago, but I know these days they put a good amount of biocides and things like that to keep stuff from growing in the ink. That said, it certainly can still happen. In fact, I recall uh, maybe it was about two months ago, we had a customer who was having mold that was growing in several of his different inks. Mold that, you know, in like noodlers and stuff like that, that is very rare because he uses some good biocides. And it was just like, it was just a really weird kind of situation. And we were like, what is happening? And, and he thought his pen was contaminated and all this kind of stuff. Come to find out, this individual had a black mold infestation in the apartment complex where he was living and had to be evacuated, had it all eradicated and everything. So it was an environmental factor. So apparently there was just so much mold everywhere where he was that it was getting into the ink and it just was not, the biocide I guess wasn't enough to kind of keep it at bay. So that's really kind of more of the factor is if you live in a moldy environment, you might see some of that stuff creeping up. Um, but in general, I just don't hear complaints about mold probably as often as you would think by reading about it on FPN and stuff like that. It is kind of a scary type of thing when it does happen, but it's not like if there's ever any mold in any of your inks, your whole pen collection's ruined and all that kind of stuff. Um, my experience has been that, um, you know, cleaning out the pen with a chlorine-based solution, so like a, a bleach, uh, type of not straight bleach or anything like that. That's usually going to be pretty strong, but like a bleach solution diluted, you know, 10 to 50, 25%, somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, that that will, you know, chlorine, chlorine kills mold. That's what it does. Um, I, <laughs> in a previous life, when I worked with my father power washing houses, uh, that's what you power wash houses with is bleach. It kills mold. Um, so that's, that's, and it does a very good job of that. So, um, you know, bleach is not great in all your pens and certain like celluloids and stuff like that, you definitely want to not use it. Um, and it's not great for soaking if you're, you know, specifically any type of metal like stainless steel, you can, you can do a diluted solution and clean it with bleach, but you don't want to like take your whole pen and just dunk it in straight bleach and leave it there for three days. That will not go well for you. Um, so you want to be kind of careful and know a little bit what you're doing. Um, I'll be completely honest. I I've, I've had it, I've had like a mold infestation happen so infrequently with any of my customers over the last six years. I really haven't researched like in full detail how to eradicate a major mold infestation because it just really hasn't happened. I haven't been in that situation where I've needed to navigate through that with somebody. I've read about it here and there on Fountain Pen Network, but it really hasn't been that big of a concern. Uh, for me or many of my customers. So I'm sorry I don't have like all the best information there, but uh, you know, and certainly I'm sure some of you watching this will hear of certain things and maybe can point me to some resources. That would be totally cool. I'm not saying that it's something that you should completely ignore and pretend like isn't a possibility, but um, if you exercise basic pen hygiene and you uh, don't live in an environment that is infested with mold, um, you'll probably be okay. That sound about right? Um, in regard to your question about humid climates, you know, I, you are where you are. I mean, I'm in central Virginia here. It's pretty darn humid all the time. Uh, I've never really had a mold problem in any of my pens or inks. So, I mean, I've had like, you know, weird inks that had strange chemical reactions have happened and bad mixtures and stuff like that. That's, that's more common than mold, but like straight up legitimate mold, really, really rare. Cool. All right, I got some uh, business questions here. I got some kind of interesting ones. So um, first one here is how exactly do you make your swabs? Oh, sorry, this is from um, Roguish Knave on Twitter. How exactly do you make your swabs, in particular the large swab? Do you make multiple passes with the Q-tip or just one? So um, yes, I have swabs. I don't actually have any on me because my swab book um, Sarah is now keeping my swab book. I don't have it in my uh, my office right now because she's 
she's our photographer who does actually all the scans and color adjustments and stuff of the swabs um, and she's now helping to actually produce them too. I used to do all the swabs myself and after a while I was like you know what I can actually teach this to somebody else. <laughs> it was getting to the point where I like, wouldn't do a swab for a week and was like all right this really needs to get done okay let me teach somebody else and then it can get done. So um, how we physically actually do the swabs. So um, the swab is basically um, uh, done on a very specific paper that we have. It's Clairefontaine pollen cardstock, um, which is not something we have available for sale. So don't write it down. Don't ask me about it. It's um, something that is not easy to obtain, but it's something I started using five years ago when we first started doing swabs and I've had to kind of keep at it. So I've got a stockpile for myself for that personal reason, but um, so that we can keep doing swabs, but it's not something available. There's other cardstock type options out there, um, but it's a very thick 210 gram thick cardstock. Um, so it's, um, you know, cut them up into two by two and a quarter inch sizes. Don't ask me why it's that size. I just arbitrarily kind of chose that a while ago and that's what we're sticking with now. Um, and then we write the name of the ink in a glass pen because glass pens are easy to clean. <laughs> that's honestly the reason why. And then um, we completely saturate a Q-tip and then just do one single very kind of intentional swab to create that swab that you see on our site. So we use that swab for the individual like ink sample swabs. We also use it for um, the bottle and swab composite image that we do. So um, it's really not that big of a swab. The actual, the actual large swab that you're referring to is about this size. It's, it's, probably, it's really actually smaller than what you're seeing here on this word card in, in actuality. So it's, it's a very small swab. So doing one intentional Q-tip swab is plenty. And the reason that we completely saturate that Q-tip with um, the ink is because that's the only like absolute kind of like um, standardization that we can have for a Q-tip swab because it is very kind of subjective and and whatnot. Um, but we use cotton Q-tip swabs and and um, completely saturate and leave them in there for like 10 seconds in the ink. So it's absolutely saturated pull it out and then do the swab. So you can see it starts out especially really heavy and then it gets kind of lighter. So you get to see a little bit of kind of variation depending on the saturation and stuff. Um, and then that's, it's at least standardized that way in terms of being completely saturated. So um, then once it's done, we let it dry obviously, and then scan it into the computer, color adjust it, um, looking at the monitor uh, versus what's actually on the swab, trying to compare the two with a consistent light source and everything and then make sure that it looks in digital form like what you see in real life on the swab because that's one thing that really is a, a, probably one of the most important steps in the whole process because some inks, especially when you scan them in and oh boy, they just look so different in digital form than it does in real life. So if you're, you probably noticed you've ever taken a picture of an ink with your cell phone or something like that, sometimes it's just like, oh, this doesn't look at all what it does like in real life. Part of that is just digitally, you're just, your, your digital representation of what you're able to visually display is not the same, it's not as, as broad as what your eyes can pick up in real life. So you will never, well at least with the current technology that we have, you will never be able to see the full spectrum of color on a digital screen as what you would see in real life. Now maybe technology will get there one day, it's very possible, it probably will eventually, but as of right now, we're always a bit limited so we have to do that color adjustment. And then once it's scanned in, we can blow it up. We can use it for kind of whatever we want. So that's, that's our process. All right, <clears throat> this question is from uh, Shubranchu D on Facebook. Shubranchu asked, is the introduction of the Cross Townsend a change in Goulet's strategy to include some of the more expensive brands or fountain pen ranges? Cost for selling a $20 and $300 pen would remain fairly similar except inventory, carrying costs, et cetera, may be slightly higher. Would Goulet move up the premium ladder? Well, yeah, that's definitely true in terms of if I'm shooting a video, the time that I would invest shooting a video on the Twisby Eco versus the Cross Townsend or an Omos Ojiva, which I'm gonna have coming out um, eventually on the new cocktail that's coming out in the fall. Um, actually just shot part of it this morning uh, before I did this video, but um, you know, the, yeah, the time invested on, well, that's actually a really good example because the Twisby Eco, that pen is $28.99. The Omos Ojiva cocktail is $395. So obviously, if I could sell as a business person, putting my business hat on here, if I could sell, you know, 10 times as many Ecos 
versus one Ojiva, it's actually business-wise, just purely looking at money, it's more economical to sell that one Ojiva because I'm making more on that one pen than I would on 10 of these because I have to pay 10 people to correspond, I have to pay 10 credit card transactions, I have to pay 10 pieces of paper that come out of the printer, I have to pay 10 you know, times that one of our team members has to handwrite a note, 10 times to pack it up, etc. A lot of overhead going on there. So, obviously, the, the natural inclination for any business that gets established is to move up market and to get more and more expensive because yes, the overhead, the, the economies of scale get uh, easier as you get into more expensive products. Somewhat. That said, um, our history, our, our whole kind of purpose that we have at Goulet Pens is to help get people into fountain pens. That's always been a major tenant of what we're all about. I personally just had my eyes open getting into the fountain pen world and I've greatly enjoyed experiencing the less expensive pens, kind of getting into some of the more expensive ones. Sometimes the more expensive ones really are worth it. Sometimes they aren't. I try to personally vet what I think is worth it or not. Now, when you get into worth of more expensive pens, there's status elements to it, you know, brand recognition. You know, the reason that people like Montblancs in certain circles is because other people know the name Montblanc and it's a status thing. You know, I'm just using Montblanc as an example because that's, that's something they really, they really, you know, kind of depend upon is their brand recognition. So that's a, that's a good example. So it's just like any other premium brand, you know. Is a, a Mercedes or a Lexus really that much better than a Toyota, you know, or a Honda? Okay, yeah, you could argue maybe, but there's a law of diminishing returns, right? As you get into more and more and more and more expensive stuff. So it's going, it's not going to be as universally appealing to everyone. So I personally really enjoy kind of the everyman, you know, products. Twisby Ecos, Pilot Metropolitans. That's part of why I love ink so much is because everybody uses ink. It's, there's commonality there. And it's something that everybody can get excited about. If I were to start talking all the time about Townsends and Ojivas and stuff like that, I would be talking very specifically to a very small group of people that would be interested in those pens and everybody else would feel kind of ostracized. So I really am very intentional about how much of those really expensive pens I talk about. I feel it's really important to educate the living daylights out of why these pens are as expensive as they are. Is it really worth it? that kind of thing? And if I really believe in it, I will spend that time to do that. Um, but that said, there will always be kind of a part of this business and myself that really just loves the very accessible products. Yes, from an economical standpoint, it does make it more challenging for me as my business grows to focus on the less expensive products because basically the less expensive something is, you have lower margins, more overhead. As the business grows, you get even more and more overhead. We have 30 people here now. That gets pretty complicated. Um, we have to have layers of management and we have to have meetings and all kinds of stuff that take time that when we were smaller, we didn't have to do that. So we're paying payroll for people to have these meetings and so on. That makes it more challenging to do what we do with less expensive products. We have a blend of things because we have a larger reach now. We have access to you know, a larger audience who would find a, a wider breadth of products with the products or whatever more appealing. So um, that's kind of worked that way. So it's, it's, for us, it's been kind of a blend. So we've tried to kind of balance that out. So we still have a very heavy focus on the um, kind of intro level stuff and then in the mid-range kind of things, even, even as we get into the more expensive stuff like the Lamy 2000s, Custom 74s, Pilot Vanishing Points, those are more of like entry-level gold nib pens, right? Because it kind of like jumps up into a different category almost. Um, but even still, so like I've got a very kind of value-focused mindset. I do still enjoy and appreciate the expensive stuff, but I don't think you'll probably see me move towards focusing purely on that stuff. I'll probably do a very good uh, range of things. And if it gets to the point where we have enough people that are really looking for the high-end stuff, but where, where it would make sense to focus a lot on that, 
but we still have a very strong core of intro, you know, fountain pen users, I would probably look to segment it a little more, maybe look to do two different types of newsletters, you know, try to make it more so that, um, you know, we're not really at that point yet. Maybe, maybe you feel differently, but um, we're, we're kind of debating about that right now is like, if we do get into roller balls more heavily or, you know, really higher end pens and all that, we don't want to have like one newsletter as an example, an email newsletter that has like all these different random things. We want to be kind of focused on, you know, what you want to actually look at. So that's something we're talking about, we're considering, and it's definitely kind of a, a strategic business challenge to think about, especially because, you know, we're getting into new stuff. These higher end pens are, you know, that's not what got me into this hobby. I got in with ink and paper and then kind of learned my way up through the pens. So as I'm getting into these more expensive pens, I'm having to learn the nuances and the subtleties that kind of make them what they are. So, um, Hopefully I answered your question in there somewhere, but um, I'm definitely not opposed to more expensive pens. I appreciate them for what they are, but I will never look to push them down everybody's throat. All right, uh, last business question I have here. Um, this is from T Grant 5 on YouTube. What are your staple books or other resources that have sh helped shape the Goulet Pen Company that we know today? What are the top three lessons that you learned while working with your dad? As a frequent customer, I thank you and your wife for running a great company, and from my view, a positive place to work for your team members. Well, thank you. I would like to think it's a positive place for everybody to work. That's uh, generally the feedback we get, so that's pretty cool. Um, staple books or other resources. So you see here, I've got a bookshelf with tons of books. I'm kind of a book junkie. I, I never used to like reading when I was younger. Um, never just, I totally get that like fiction reading is very popular. It just never really did it for me. I don't know, I'm such a just practical guy. I wanna be able to apply stuff in my real life. So I like biographies of like, you know, George Washington and like, you know, people like that. Um, but uh, mainly what I read is, you know, business leadership type books. Um, I really like hearing people's stories. So people that have built businesses themselves, people that have done kind of what I am doing and then have done it successfully and they go back and write about it, that to me is the most valuable personally. Um, so I tend to focus really on people like that that have kind of built their own businesses and then written books about it. So it tends to kind of be kind of a narrow uh, window of stuff that I end up reading, but there's just so many books out there. It's unbelievable. So I'm sure I'll get more into other stuff later on. And I do have like, you know, kind of my own personal, like, you know, faith-based religious type books and stuff that I read that, you know, can influence like my, my own kind of value system and stuff like that. Um, but as far as like the direction of our company, it's more of these uh, business books. So I've got a couple that I've talked about before that I can shout out again. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk's book, Crush It. Um, might as well pull it out. I have it right here. Um, Crush It was extremely uh, impactful for me. I read it at a time in my life that was very influential. Um, it was right when we started this business, actually a little bit before we officially started carrying fountain pen products. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk um, basically did exactly what I've done, but in the wine business. So he, he didn't start his company from scratch. He took over, uh, you know, worked with his dad in his liquor store and uh, Gary V really got into wine and ended up doing video blogging and social media. He's got 1.1 million followers on Twitter, or something like that. Um, and now he's got his own social media company um, that he's built uh, after leaving his uh, dad's business. So um, he's really, really literally kind of wrote the book on how to, you know, build an audience around being a subject matter expert you know, and that kind of thing. So I read this and I was like, I have to become an expert on fountain pens and then I need to create a video blog on that. And that's literally what I've done. So that book was very, very influential for me. Gary V is a hustler who just, his, his passion is unbelievable. He puts me to shame. He makes me feel like a slacker and I'm not joking. So, <laughs> um, let's see here. Dave Ramsey has a book called Entree Leadership that has been extremely influential for me. There's Dave's face right there. Um, Dave has been pretty influential for me. So his, um, you know, he's a little more out there, outspoken and stuff on his faith because he kind of came up through like the church circles with a um, kind of a financial lens. So he, helped, you know, gets people out of debt. Um, but even still, um, what I really like about his book, Entree Leadership, is he's got a lot of just like very practical 
things that have helped him to put structure around his business as he grew it from literally, like he talks about, um, a card table in his living room. So Rachel and I have really had to do the same kind of thing, just kind of like build a company from scratch and not just, not just have a store, but actually build a company and a culture and a team. And that's a lot of what Entree Leadership talks about. And he's had very practical things. So we've done a lot of uh, very kind of hands-on things with the way we run our company based on Entree Leadership. Um, another really good book, uh, kind of along that line, I actually discovered this one through Dave Ramsey, is Patrick Lencioni. Um, he wrote, he's written several really good books, but the one that has come out most recently that kind of caps it all together is called The Advantage. Um, really good one. It focuses on organizational health and building a leadership team and focuses on, on how to have effective meetings and proper communication and stuff like that. This has become more and more essential as we've been like more than 20 people because it gets hard to communicate when, for example, right now I'm closed up in my office as I'm shooting this video. I'm not around everybody else, so I can't hear what's going on. I can't you know, impart my, you know, experience and, and um, you know, language or whatever you want to call it, values onto the people I work with. So as we get bigger and I spend less time one-on-one -on -one with individuals, proper communication and establishing values and stuff like that really becomes more important. And then the last one, I've got a lot of really good ones, honestly, but then the last one that was really good is uh, from Simon Sinek. It's called Start With Why. This is a really good one too, and this doesn't necessarily have to be a business related one. This could be personally or whatever. Start with why. It just talks about the importance of understanding your purpose um, and communicating why you do what you do first, not what or how you do what you do. So he, uh, the, the one phrase that he has out of that book that I really resonate with is that um, specifically related to business is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So that is kind of like the, the sentence that just explains that entire book right there. So for example, I'm sitting here talking to you about products right now, but that might excite you, but it's not just the product knowledge, it's the reason behind it. Like I said, like I want to help people learn about fountain pens who are interested in it and get educated and be able to experience this. That is the why behind my company existing, right? So that's... Um, that's kind of it right there. So those have been really influential for me. So then to talk about kind of the latter part of your question, um, you asked, uh, you know, what, what are the top three lessons that I learned while working with my dad? So I've talked about working with my dad um, a little bit before, um, but basically working with my dad was most of my childhood because my parents had a business in the house and I worked with them a fair amount of my childhood on my spring breaks and summers and a lot of times after school I would be, you know, at four and five years old, I was stapling invoices to manila folders for a penny a piece and my parents had like a little bank of mom and dad checkbook that they had, you know, written up so when I wanted to buy a toy at the store I had to look at how much money I had earned and then I would have to like write a little check to my parents and stuff like that. Um, I do kind of a similar thing and actually Dave Ramsey's gotten another book kind of completely different from that um, called Smart Money, Smart Kids where he talks about how to teach your kids uh, the value of money and how to relate to that and stuff like that. So I really didn't have an allowance when I was a kid. I would, I would kind of have to earn uh, my keep, which I think has translated a lot into the way that I think now um, and the way that I'm raising my own kids. But um, I had that opportunity to do that because my parents had a business in the house and it was, it was very natural for that to happen. So I really kind of worked with my dad a lot and he would always teased me like how to fix things around the house and he was a very kind of handy guy. So he instilled a lot of that in me. Uh, but then specifically, I worked with him. Once I graduated college, I wasn't uh, really wanting to get into the industry I'd gotten my degree in. Um, my degree was in property management uh, in real estate. And this was in 2006 when I graduated. So the real estate bubble was about to pop right as I graduated. And I kind of saw the writing on that wall. And it wasn't really my ultimate passion anyway. So I, I basically went, you know, gave up a name your own price offer with a, a commercial real estate company and, uh, and worked with my dad power washing houses. Basically because I wanted to just, I knew that that was a time in my life I would get to work with my dad that I would never get back. And, uh, and it, was, it was something that I knew that I would be able to get some kind of more entrepreneurial experience but not having to start completely from scratch. So my dad had started the business my senior year of college so I was still very much kind of influential in getting in on the ground floor. 
um, but I wasn't having to you know, be completely on my own learning all the hard knocks and risking all the capital and everything. So I was able to kind of piggyback off of what he had started and the two of us together really worked to kind of help grow the business a little bit. Ultimately, it didn't end up working out. There was a lot of seasonality to that business um, that I just wasn't able to navigate personally. Um, so I ended up starting as a hobby, um, turning pens in my spare time as I was working with my dad in his business. And then it was through the pen turning, pen making thing that I ended up uh, eventually going kind of full time and transitioning out of my dad's business to do my own thing. Didn't really pick up steam, but then because I was doing in the pen world, I then discovered fountain pens and the rest is Goulet history, right? So there's kind of a story there with all that. But basically the, the three most important things to actually answer your question. Um, that I learned from my dad is literally our number one Goulet core value, which is work hard, be honest, be flexible, right? Like I have this little engraving up here, which I'm not sure how well you can actually see it. Oh, stepping on the mic. Um, but I've got this little plaque, which my parents actually engraved for me, work hard, be honest, be flexible. And this is a mantra that I was raised with as a child, and it was something that we um, talked about when we were running our business together. Um, but basically, if you do that stuff, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. Um, just in general, in life, if you work hard, you're honest and you're flexible, um, that's pretty good life lessons right there. So that is, that is the biggest stuff that I learned from my dad. And so once we actually sat down four years into this business and kind of defined our core values after learning how important that was from real basically all these guys, um, that's when I, I looked at that and said, you know what, number one value right there. And um, we debated about splitting it out and do we really need, like we have seven core values, but then there's kind of like a three in one as the first one, so it's kind of like nine, it's a lot of values, do we have too many, whatever. but. That's what we ended up working out with our culture from the input of everybody on the team at the time. Um, and everybody felt really strongly about rolling up those three into our value number one with the Goulet pen. So it's kind of what helped start the company. Um, and it's, uh, it's really kind of you know, meaningful in that way. So, um, and then just another lesson in general working. So I worked with my dad, but it, we weren't side by side all the time. So we washed houses. Um, but we had kind of separate, um, you know, trucks that we would go and wash, wash, and wash, and wash, and wash. And I also did, you know, deck sealing and cleaning and painting, stuff like that. So that was, all that stuff was really kind of independent from him once we had separate um, rigs. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, gosh, I was 23 at the time. And I kind of knew what I was doing, but kind of not. So stuff would break down, like equipment would break down, customers would asked to change things and people would not leave checks and you know just all kinds of random things would happen mainly it was equipment breakdowns and weather complications and stuff like that and i would call my dad and be like dad you know what do i do i don't really know and he was like look brian i'm i'm washing houses right now like you i can't fix your equipment for you you have to figure it out yourself i'll help guide you as best i can but you're gonna have to learn to fix it yourself and it kind of like sunk in with me there because i I'd, I'd been through school and you know i'm I didn't love school, but you're kind of like handheld a little bit through the whole school process. You're never really just completely just on your own. But once you graduate and you're, and every, anyone who's past school can relate to this. Once you graduate, nobody really cares that much, aside from your family and those who are closest to you, nobody really cares that much whether you succeed or fail. You really have to fend for yourself. So that really kind of sunk in for me there. I was like, oh, so no one really cares whether my equipment works or not, except me, so I better figure this out. And that really kind of, kind of sunk in with me right at that time. Of course, it wasn't like the first time in my life I had experiences like that, but in terms of post-graduation, like more important than just choosing my class schedule or something like that, it was really like, oh, like if I wanna get paid by this customer to do this service for them, I have to fix this equipment right now, otherwise I can't do my job. So that's when it really kind of started to sink in with me, like, oh, I can seek the help of others, but ultimately I'm accountable for it. So personal accountability became a really important thing that my dad taught me. That was a really long answer to that question, but that's why I only had 10 questions this week, because I knew a couple of them would go kind of long. So anyway, I'll take another sip of water here, but hopefully it's kind of cool. Hope, hope you like that. Got one personal question as if the one I just answered wasn't personal enough. <clears throat> AJ Manjingo, I hope I said that right, on YouTube. Brian, I know you really like your custom 74, as I do mine. 
because it is beautiful and reliable. I have to wonder though, with a collection of 300 pens, you do not have any higher end pens that have some special value or just write like a dream. I know you're a new pen retailer, but I have to imagine that you have some awesome pens that would knock the Custom 74 or Lamy 2000 out of your top two. It's a great question, AJ. Great question. And I am a newish pen retailer, but you know we're going to be hitting six years pretty soon, so it's not that new. Um, so I've, I've been around the block a little bit anyway. I definitely don't know it all, but I'm, I'm not a newbie at this point, and I'll recognize that. Um, so the thing I want to say is like those are not my top pens because they're the best pens that I have. Um, they are awesome pens and they are, they've been with me for a while, so they're kind of meaningful to me. The, the reason I like pens like the Vanishing Point Lamy 2000 Custom 74 is they're really good pens. They're a really good value for what they are, and they're great carry around pens. I am very nomadic because I work at home and at the office, even in the office here, like the most continuous time I usually spend in my office is shooting Q and A's. I am not joking. Like when I'm shooting a video, that's usually the longest stretch of time I spend actually in my office. Other than that, I'm bouncing in and out. I'm in meetings, I'm around, I'm seeing what else is going on in the company. You know, there's a lot, we got 12,000 square feet in this building. So it's a lot of area to cover just to kind of know what's going on on a daily basis. So I spend a lot of time out and about. So um, I'm, I like to carry pens with me that can, can take a little bit of abuse, right? Not that I really abuse my pens, but even still, I want pens that I know are going to hold up well carrying around and ones that are really nice, but if I were to lose them or break them, it wouldn't be the end of the world to me. So there's certainly nicer pens that I have. Um, there's certainly more expensive pens, and there's other ones that write like a dream. Like for example, um, I love the Omas Ojiva. Big fan of that. I have that in a medium nib. Um, and, you know, the cocktail is going to be coming out in a Blue Angel, which uh, is a, like pretty much a perfect Goulet Blue. So I can almost guarantee you I'm going to take one of those. Um, Waterman Kareen, I've got in fine nib, writes really well. Um, I got several Pelican pens that really write great. Um, I have a Parker Dual Fold in a medium nib that's incredibly wet, but writes really nicely. Um, and then I have, I have lots of other pens that are not just good writers, but ones that are kind of more sentimental or mean something to me. I have lots of different Edison pens that I've collaborated with Brian Gray, and we've come up with prototypes or done experiments and stuff like that that have some have done better than others. And so I have a lot of those pens um, that are kind of more sentimental to me. And of course they write well, but uh, those are ones that I wouldn't carry around with me because they mean too much to me in case I would lose them or break them or something like that. Um, and then uh, other ones like I've got a, a, some that have been a gift, like I have a Namiki Custom Impression that's gorgeous. I have a couple of Mont Blanc pens, which normally I wouldn't like status-wise care about carrying around a Mont Blanc, but like somebody gave it to me as a gift and so it means something. So there's, other, there's things like that that, you know, uh, it's not that I want to always use the nicest pens that I have. Certainly I will carry those around, but honestly, I think it's important for me just being in the situation that I'm in, to um, really know well the pens that are kind of accessible to everyone. So I will, you know, right now I'm carrying around, uh, not this one, but I have a Twisby Eco. So like I'm carrying around a Twisby Eco, I've got inked up with Lamy Blue, um, and I've got that here in my pen case that I'm using. Um, I've also got uh, Pilot Custom 912 with a stub nib that I have with Jerobon Emerald of Shavor. When I get a customer request to, to write their note for them, I'll use that ink just so I can really kind of wow them <laughs> since it's not available yet. Uh, I got a custom 74 with a fine nib. Just enjoy that one very much. I have a pilot vanishing point here um, that I've got with an extra fine nib because I've been testing out some different papers and stuff like that. So I want to have that really fine nib as a way to do that. Um, you know, and I've got several other pens in here as well. So I'll keep a good kind of range of pens, um, but I really just want to—I really want to experience it all, kind of. So that's what I'll uh, what I'll end up doing there. So yeah, I have I have some nicer pens for sure, but uh, those I tend to kind of leave and, and not use quite as often as some of the other ones, especially because I I kind of have a habit of putting ink in my pen and then leave it there, letting it kind of dry out, and not cleaning it out as much or as often as I should. It happens to the best of us.
Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of why. So a lot of my nicer pens will sit and get used a little less often. And that's about all I have to say about that. Last question I have for this week. Um, this is a troubleshooting question uh, from Leah K on Facebook. I'm fairly new to fountain pens, although I used one many years ago. Recently, I was using my fountain pens to take notes during a webinar on my computer. With the ceiling fan on, it may have dried out the pen a bit, as I noticed it didn't seem to flow well. I wound up actually putting more ink in it, even though it probably still had a decent supply left. How could I have prevented this, or what should I have done in this situation? Um, okay, so you mentioned the ceiling fan. I don't really know how much that ceiling fan actually made a difference. Yes, the more air movement could uh, cause the water to evaporate out of your ink, but I think, uh, I think that that probably would just happen anyway. Um, it's more about the humidity, the relative humidity in the air, than it is about air movement, sort of. Um, but uh, I think it's probably just that the pen was uncapped a little long. So um, this is very common for people who haven't used fountain pens or haven't used them in a while. You're used to using ball points and roller balls where you just uncap it and you write and you leave it sitting there and you don't really think about it. Um, but if you're leaving the pen sitting there for a while, uh, fountain pen ink is water-based. So when it's sitting there and the nib is exposed and it's just exposed and exposed and exposed to uh, dry air if you're in a hot, like dry environment. I don't know where you're from, but um, if you're in like a very air conditioned environment, air conditioning causes humidity to drop. Um, it could uh, have the ink, uh, the water in the ink evaporating out of the pen, which would then cause starting and issues and flow issues and stuff like that if it's uncapped for too long. So it's really more of a, a habit that you'll need to get into of uh, just when you're writing and then you're not going to be writing for a while just recapping the pen. And it becomes second nature. Um, and there's certain pens that are better than others for that purpose. Um, you know, I did a video on quick draw pens not too long ago, which the ultimate kind of quick draw pen is um, the Pilot Vanishing Point because it's a click. So it's very super convenient. So you click it, write with it, and then you unclick it. And you'll kind of get into that habit, click, unclick. Um, and then that will keep your nib from, from drying out in normal use. So um, that's, that's what I probably would assume is what's happening. And certain pen and ink combinations can be more susceptible to drying out when it's left out like that. So um, another good one is the Lamy 2000. That one can be really good um, for doing that because it has a hooded nib. So it just has a little itty bitty part of a nib, which where is my Lamy 2000? It's not in here. Give me a second. I actually have my pens somewhat organized now so I can grab it fairly quickly. So I have a Lamy 2000 right here, which is one of my favorite pens. Um, it has a hooded nib, and which means that only a little bit of the nib is sticking out here, and most of it is covered up. So if you're, not only can you hold it closer to the nib if that's your style, but it will stay wetter longer as it's just kind of sitting there. It won't dry out as much as another pen that has this huge, big, exposed nib and feed. So that could be a factor as well. But um, yeah, that's kind of it. I think that I think that's what's going on. And that kind of covers it. So we have now come to the end of our broadcast. Um, I normally think of a question of the week ahead of time, and I'm just looking at my sheet and realizing that it's completely blank. So I'm going to have to kind of make one up on the fly. So I talked about some of my favorite books. I am a book junkie, and I love books. I'd be very curious to know, whether it's in business or in your personal life, what are the three most influential books that you have read that have enhanced or impacted where you have gone in your life? Um, it'd be cool to hear kind of a business context if that makes sense, but even personal stuff would be kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's what I would like to know for this week is what, uh, what are the three most influential books that you've read? So that's it for this week. If you uh, want to check out any of the products I talked about, I'm going to link them up in the blog. Um, and then uh, for next week, I am going to do Q&A, but I'll give you a heads up. I'm going to have both my um, uh, community coordinators uh, who are normally helping me on our social media and creating content that will um, not be here. They'll be on vacation. So I'm going to be uh, flying a little more solo than usual. So I'm going to be active on some social channels, but maybe not as active as normally we would seem because we'll be very shorthanded. So um, just, just a little heads up there. So. That's about it for this week. Um, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like these videos um, and check out some of the other stuff that we put out in the last week or so. We've been 
and trying to work hard for you. So I um, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for watching another broadcast. Be sure to check me out on Periscope. Love to see you live. That's live and interactive. You can hit me up in the chat. I can say your name and say hello. It's pretty cool. So check that out. Thanks so much for watching. Right on.